Please, please, the free comes on. Okay, I'm sorry, I got distracted with Lisa. Uh, Dr. John Little, Patel, Patel, Mr. Bruce Legler, Legler, I am so sorry, and uh, another friend, Melissa Bergkind. Uh, Dr. Young. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I had to shake your chief of staff's hand because having served as chief of staff at a major hospital in the Orlando area, I know getting those. <laughs> HCAP scores, willingness to recommend is very difficult. You happen to be one of the best hospitals in Florida. And I'm going to say that to start. And I'm not pulling any legs here, so don't count that against my time because I'm giving you some good news. All right? That doesn't mean I've been a physician for 33 years, board certified family medicine. Uh, I'm an Army veteran. I served in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Joint Task Force, Guantanamo Bay. My very first patients at George Washington University in 1985 were men with Kaposi sarcoma and emesis pneumonia. We didn't know what was going on. And those patients got a lot more personal attention and a lot more compassion than we ever saw with the COVID patients in any hospital in this country, regardless of their HCAPS scores. I still have privileges at five different hospitals. I am on call, as I said, 24-7. And um, during this operation COVID-19, I have to say, I'm going to be season five this year. I never worked harder as an army soldier. And all these guys behind me, all these nurses know, we never worked harder as men and women in the medical profession than we did during the Delta variant. So I'm not here to condemn at all anybody. But I'm here to see a little bit of insight and try to calm things down because, you know, I had to do a lot of praying before I drove up here. My first patient was at 8 o'clock this morning in Ocala, Florida. My next patient will be at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in Ocala, Florida. And I work until 10 o'clock last night. And I work until 10 o'clock tonight. That's what I do because I love my patients. Because there's no hope without, excuse me, there's no healing without hope. There's no healing without relationship. And both of those things were in the gutter during the Delta variant. So let me give you a few quick stories because I only have a couple of minutes. So let me, one, one minute, yes. Okay. Let me tell you about the mayor and the car salesman, New Year's Eve, 2020. Car salesman comes into one hospital, he's refused by a neck, and he spends three months in the hospital, he survives. He says to me after he got my car from my daughter, I survived because of you coming to see me every day when I couldn't see my kids. He's the only, only parent who kids 12 and 15. The mayor calls me, he's hypoxic, chief of police, fire department. He's got the Delta variant. He gets into another hospital, guess what he gets? He gets ivermectin. All right, the only patient in the entirety of the Delta variant got ivermectin legally. Let me tell you about the wife, the persistent wife, who I gave her ivermectin. She insisted on staying with her husband. He was in the hospital for another three months. He walked out of that hospital because she gave him ivermectin. Let me tell you about the new mom. When the obstetrician called me, I actually talked to the other obstetrician, said, do you know anyone that can treat a woman with COVID? I go to this woman's bedside, after giving birth to her baby, she works as a nurse across the street at the other hospital, I'm not mentioning any names, she went to the ER with COVID, they said, wait, come back when you're under 90% oxygen saturation. She was admitted for her baby, C-section, I walk in there, she's blue as can be, no O2 sats, excuse me, sir, 72% pulse ox, and nothing being done. I took ivermectin out of my pocket, I gave it to her. Now, I got dozens of cases I can't share with you, but let me just tell you this, thing. one more minute, sir, no. I took two and a half hours here. Right. Just let me say this. We are not noise. We are not noise. I'm going to tell you this. If you're going to be the best, be the first to admit wrongdoing in all humility and realize, just realize that these lives would have been, just think of all the patients' lives that would have been spared. And I was disciplined for giving my remedy. I've been fined $500. I've been suspended two weeks. I've been on the American Board of Family Medicine in the Florida Department of Health in two hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. an independent third party who basically said we had 24% better outcomes than our peer group. I'm not a contracted physician. I'm able to speak my mind. That's why I asked. I said thank you for your advocacy for patients and doctors. All right. Second thing was is to follow the money. I'm kind of a numbers guy and give the hospital a benefit. Or was there any? Yeah, you're, you're not allowed to record that. You can 
So can't videotape him? What are we doing there? Interesting. He said, I can't video what's happening out there. Any doctor that wanted to prescribe a mentin or any Get out of the meeting. What what just happened in there, Doctor Latell? Tell, tell first of all, tell us who you are, what's going on here, and what just happened. I'm a family doc. I work in Ocala, Florida. This morning, I drove down here just to give a voice for the voiceless, the people who were treated unfairly during COVID, uh, worse than unfairly. My own experience as a doctor caring for patients in four hospitals, and I have to tell you, Sarah Soto did an amazing job of allowing people to have a voice today, although they cut our time down at the last minute to three minutes, and in my case, two and a half minutes. So I didn't get to say what I wanted to say because I was only given two and a half minutes to really speak about my concerns. What happened just now is that there's a wonderful board member who I just met for the first time. I went up to her after the meeting, or I thought it was near the end of the meeting. I just asked her if there was any chance I could say something more uh, because I had been cut short. And I wanted to say, had I had a few more minutes to say, she herself voiced the fact that there's doctors on staff at this hospital who will not speak their mind because for fear of retribution, for fear of losing their job. And what I wanted to tell her as a doctor who's taken care of other physicians with COVID for the last three years, other physicians, cardiologists, pathologists, obstetricians, pediatricians calling me for ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, but they wouldn't ever let anyone know. This is what's happened. The hospitalists, even in this hospital, do not want people to know where they stand because they, have, they are fearful of eventually being kicked out of either the hospital or their own groups. So the reason I came here, I said, I'm, all I said is I'm wearing this white coat. I represent myself and most importantly, my contract with my patients. So that's different. Hospital anymore, 99% of doctors have a contract, an exclusive contract with the hospital or they're employed by the hospital. They cannot speak their minds freely. But what do they do when they had COVID, especially during Delta? They call doctors like me all over the state. I got calls from doctors and lawyers and mayors and, and teachers. And I just treated them with the stuff that I knew worked and kept him out of the hospital. So I, what happened here tonight was simply, I guess I violated protocol. I have to confess, I have not ever been at a hospital board meeting, ever. I've been chief of staff, but not this kind of meeting where I thought I could walk up and just say thank you to what, to what the lady said. And the treatment I got was for a half a dozen, you know, uniformed folks to initially walk me out of there and then say I had to leave the entire premises of the hospital as though I'm some kind of a criminal. And all they did was keep my mind. Well, I mean, you can't. You got up there and you said you treated a lot of patients with ivermectin, and then you were going to talk to the what board member and what what's her name? What the one that, that, that said, was talking that he was. Well, I mean, I'm not sure okay, she was saying something that you liked yeah, uh, sure she's gonna be a kind of a about how, about how the, and how how people are afraid to speak up, and then right as she was saying, right as you were talking to her and you were trying to compliment her that she was a, about her saying that doctors are afraid to speak up because of what might happen to them. You, a doctor, spoke up and were esco and were escorted out by police officers. Right. I, I whispered to her. I didn't want to disrupt the meeting, if you notice. I didn't go in and shout. I just went up to her quietly, bent over, thanked her for her time. Listen, I've been at meetings in, in Tallahassee and in Washington, D.C. I've never actually been told I couldn't go up to a congressman, a, state, a, a legislator, or a state senator, and actually whisper to them, you know, the conclusion meeting. I have never been, in Tallahassee, I've never been treated like this. But the Cyrus of the hospital decides to treat me like a common criminal and escort me off their premises because they have the audacity of complimenting a board member for saying something good and offering my services to her if she wanted to reach out to me after the meeting. That's all I said. It seems like you proved their point. point. Uh, what did you think about this report, especially, the you report know? Is, uh, very well prepared, very um, uh, designed to assuage the community leaders into thinking that every hospital that treated every patient with COVID did the right thing. When in fact, every hospital continues to unnecessarily test people. When they say they have these great results in cases of COVID, you have to understand 90% of the people right now that are being diagnosed as COVID in hospitals don't even have COVID symptoms. They're not even sick with COVID. Most of them are not. They're just routinely testing these folks because still of the financial incentives and then it can kind of pad their numbers when the patients leave and they haven't died from COVID pneumonia, which we saw in Delta, but now they say they have a 95% whatever survival rate. These are patients like my own adopted son who went in with a ruptured aneurysm into the University of Florida Hospital and was put in isolation because he tested positive for COVID when nothing was happening that had anything to do with COVID and he was restricted with this visitation restriction. So I'm, I, it blows my mind how the medical profession has basically lost so much compassion and common sense during this time. I gave him compliments. I said, Sarasota, you have a great willingness to recommend score HCAPs. 
you guys are amazing. You must do amazing things in this hospital. But let's not blow you know, smoke at us right now and try to tell us that what you do with COVID patients is acceptable. It'll never be acceptable. And they, if they want to be the best hospital, if they want to be the best, have need to be the first to admit that they did wrong. And as that board member said, that they didn't listen to the doctors. They didn't entertain alternative treatments. They didn't even look at uh, early treatment. When I brought that up in my hospital, I can't mention the hospital right now. I will at some other point. But when I brought up early treatment to the medical executive council, they said, we don't, we're don't. going to open up more isolation units. We're not talking about early treatment. I said, why not try to get people out of your hospital, prevent them from coming into the hospital? No one wanted to hear it then. No one wants to hear it now. They're still looking at the bottom line, which is hospital care patients. This is why people have lost faith and confidence in hospitals. Who wants to come to a hospital that doesn't care about keeping them out of the hospital in the first place? Or see a doctor that won't go out of his way or her way to keep them out of the hospital? That's all. And I'm happy to be a voice for those patients. And that's why I'm here. So uh, maybe they didn't like your tie. I'm seeing, uh, it looks like what our founding father's um, mm-hmm. signatures. Thomas uh, Jefferson. Uh, that's oh, the man. Thomas Jefferson. Oh, that'll, that'll get you thrown we need out. To have, you know, you need to have... They got along. They got along. They didn't like each other. They got along. That's why we have the country we have. These board members and we doctors, as I started out with my comments, you know, we're all in a medical profession. We should have gotten along. We should have had conversations. We weren't allowed to have conversations. They shut me down every time I brought up, you know, and God forbid, you know, I'm unvaxxed. They even told me when I was I couldn't eat in the physician's lounge. I couldn't. You know, seen I that couldn't. before. So, so this is the kind of com- the way we're being treated and said, let's have a conversation, let's, let's talk. So that one board member, God, re- God bless her, she said, let's have a conversation. These are intelligent people. Like I said recently, we all took organic chemistry. We're supposed to be the bi- best and brightest minds in the, in the country, right? We passed and we excelled, hopefully, in organic chemistry. And yet we get to this issue and we're just getting basic concepts of pharmacology and pathophysiology and we won't have a conversation. So. You know, I, I make an appeal to these doctors to just allow other doctors with different perspectives to share their views for the sake of the patients. They deserve it. Well, do you think the governor needs to do something here? Uh, that they maybe let this thing expire, yeah. this uh, yeah, this liability it. shield? I know. And, and just, Governor, we know that there is a lot of power going on in here. I mean, look at this place. It's massive. There's lots of money here. There's lots. But what does the governor need to do that's the right thing, Dr. Yeah, Littell? Yeah, the immunity bill which uh, one of the legislators, Burton, actually, when she put that out there, and she said, and I, I met her, and I'd like to meet her again, actually, because I would say, why would you put out a flyer saying we need to protect providers? She said, we need to protect our providers of health care. Well, you know what? If I'm living in Sarasota, and I, have to, and I, and I get sick and I'm going to be brought here, why would I want to do anything to criticize our providers? I want to protect our providers. Well, no, there's a difference between protecting providers and actually saying to the hospitals, you cannot continue to abide by policies to the exclusion of the patient's requested options and also other doctors coming in. Like I said, I got discipline for giving ivermectin, which got a young mom out of the hospital in three days when she would have died. Got a mayor out of the hospital in three days when he was already home in hypoxic and no one could figure out what to do with him. So, and I, that's just, I could go on and on, dozens and dozens of cases. They wouldn't give me time in there. So if my treatments were effective, well, look at me. Now, I'm going to be 65. I had the Alpha variant and I had the Omicron. I didn't miss one day of work, not one day of work in the last three years and longer than that, because I took the early treatment protocols. And now that, I'm not, they say, oh, that's anecdotal. That's anecdotal. Not when you've done this thousands of times. Why does it make them so mad when you say that ivermectin works? Why, why does it, was it the media? Was it Fauci? Is it some type of mind control that's going on here or hypnosis perhaps what what, what exactly if mass formation psychosis possibly why do, what this is what a lot of people a lot of normal just regular people who are not involved in activism who are not involved in these things but just are just wondering like when you come and you say no this is working i can show you it's working and it has no side effects whereas your drug seems to be shutting people's organs down doctors, and there's this stubbornness and they just won't doctors, budge and i see it in their eyes doctors need to fall on their swords right so um let me show you this this was an article that was in the lakeland ledger all right october 2021 that was about my prescribing ivermectin 20 to 40 times per week this is what one of the pulmonary critical care doctors said in Lakeland. I got his name. It's right here. It's a matter of public. It says his name is Dr. Sergio Sion in Lakeland Pulmonology. He wrote, if federal agencies say you shouldn't do something and you do it anyway, you're not practicing the current standard of medical care. 
It's extremely poor practice of medicine to prescribe medication that these federal agencies don't support. They will fall on their swords rather than give a medication that the CDC, the NIH, does not want them to give. And that's what these doctors have done. They've said, we've been, we've been following protocol. I had the chief executive officer of a large hospital, the largest one in the state of Florida, say to me, say to me, Dr. Littell, we expect our physicians to be lockstep with us when it comes to policy. Lock on, on a phone call that my wife listened to. I wish I had taken. Point is, they have been beaten over the head that they will do what the hospital protocols and CDC and NIH will do, come hell or high water. And when a doctor like me starts to, you know, say, hey, there's something that's really cheap out there that can keep your patients out of the hospital and save lives, they don't want to hear about it except for the doctor should call me after hours and say, hey, you know, the anesthesiologist should call me, the pulmonologist, the cardiologist, the general surgeon, the obstetrician, the pediatrician. I'm not making this stuff up. And they call me the emergency room physician who's 70 years old near Orlando who called me in the midst. He said, John, I'm not doing well. I'm getting hypoxic. I gave him these medications. He went back to work in a week. He's still alive to this day. And he was high risk. So, no, when it, and it's going to affect their lives. I think some of them start to realize this is really good stuff. The hospital has to stay with the protocols. And don't tell me, let me close with this or finish. And my very first patient I treated for COVID was a, was a critical care nurse. This is in April of 2020. Who took care of the first patient in Ocala, Florida, that died from COVID, made the front page of the newspaper. He was a 52-year-old grocer. Every, you know, people knew him. She calls me, she's a Dr. Mattel. I have COVID, I'm sick, I have fever, body ache. I said, go ahead and get tested at this time. He's tested. He said, she tells me the hospital won't test her. They're holding on to the test kits. They're like a platinum or something. I said, okay, we're going to treat you anyway. She said, can you give me hydroxychloroquine? She was the first patient I had that knew about it. I was already doing research. She got it. She got better. I went into the hospital two days later, the doctor's lounge. You've got the CEO. Now, mind you, at the same time, same time I have a patient who just had open heart surgery that was dying. Complications. He's dying. I find out that he was tested for COVID. He's in the ICU dying from complications of coronary artery disease, not COVID. I talked to the chief medical officer and the CEO of that hospital in that lounge. I said, excuse me, my patient who's a critical care doctor that works here, critical care doctor that works here, our nurse, she gets tested, excuse me, you won't test her, but you'll test my other patients who's, got, who's dying from heart disease. What's going on with that? Are you guys getting paid to test people for COVID? CEO, CMO saying, no, I don't think so. The young chief financial officer in the back, brand new, left behind years, they turned to him and they said, hey, do you know anything about that? He says, oh yeah, we get an incentive from the federal government for every positive COVID test. That guy's not even with them anymore, by the way, as a CFO. So they get incentivized for testing for COVID. Every patient that comes in the hospital that's tested positive, they get a financial incentive. And if they use the protocols, they get more. That's a fact. Well, why are they saying that they lost all this money during COVID? That's up to Sarasota Memorial to kind of come out. To see. I can imagine that they lost money. Obviously, there was a lot of federal funds that went out. A lot of, there were a lot of funds that went out for people who lost money because of COVID. So um, I know as a doctor, I was told if I could document how much I lost, the federal government would give me X amount of money, right? That was everybody, every business, right? We all know those funds went out there. So I don't know if they lost and if the federal government paid them back twice as much. I don't know. You guys need to do the reporting. That, I, guess, I guess I'm a reporter. You're a doctor. I'm a reporter. So that's that's my, my end. I got I to do some actual research. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Littell. Thank you, um, Chris Nelson. Chris, God, yes, God bless and you. Uh, you so God bless you, too. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.